In this video, we're going to walk through how we take high-level loop constructs uh, from languages like C and C++ and make the same kind of control flow in AT Robots assembly. The first type of loop I want to look at is the post-sentinel do-while loop. So this is a data-driven loop. It executes at least one time. Uh, and so we fall into the do immediately, run the contents of the loop, and then we check our sentinel condition at the end. And as long as that condition is true, we jump back up to the top and run through the meat of the code again. When that loop condition fails, we fall through and move on through the rest of the code. So uh, our assembly needs to do the same. So here we need a label at the top to identify this do while loop. Uh, and we need one at the top, unlike the if and else multi-condition uh, multi statements we've seen before, because a loop, unlike a plain old if statement has to jump back up in the code in order to repeat things. So that's what this top label is for. And just like our C code here that multiplies the FX registers contents by three, that's what we're going to do over here. Now I've highlighted this in blue again. And if you remember this from a previous video, that means uh, this is something that we might be able to modify to get better performance. So after we've done the multiplication, we do the uh, sentinel check on our loop. We, met, we look at the conditional. So we compare fx to 400. And then notice that we jump uh, when fx is less than or equal to 400. That is the same logic that we used over here. Because if that condition holds, that's when we want to take the jump in this case. So we'll go back up to the top of the do while loop and can you continue with the rest. Now, if that condition fails and fx turns out to be greater than 400, it's at that point that we don't do the jump, which means we just fall through outside of the while loop and we move right on. So that works great. Simple structure uh, and it's very similar uh, logically to some of the stuff that you've seen us do even in constructing if statements. Now what about that multiply? So the reason I highlighted that multiply, you may think that can't be improved because it's just a single line of code. In fact, we're going to improve it by making it three times bigger, three lines of code. What matters about that one line of code, if you go back to the instructions video, you'll see that the multiply instruction costs 10 clock cycles in the AT robots architecture. So that's a fairly expensive thing compared to, say, an addition instruction, which only takes a single clock cycle. So what we can do here is effectively, since we want to multiply by 3, just add the value to itself three times. But we can't really say add fx to fx and add fx to fx again. Uh, if we did that, the first time we would add uh, fx to itself, we'd get two times the original value, which is great. That's on its way to being three times the value. But if we then added fx again to itself, since it's already double, we'd be adding double the value to double the value, and we'd have four times the original value of x when we really need three. So what we do here is I make a copy of the original fx value into the ax register. Then I add that copy back to fx, which makes the fx register contain twice its original value. Then I add ax, which is one times fx, the original fx value. Uh, I add that to 2 times fx, and that gives me 3 times fx. And even though it's 3 instructions, because each of these costs 1 cycle, that's 3 cycles instead of 10. So uh, we may have exploded this thing in terms of lines of code by a factor of 3, but we've improved its performance by nearly the same. And that's great. Now let's look at a pre-sentinel while loop. Again, a data-driven loop. We don't know how many times it's going to execute because uh, there's usually uh, variables that get their value from data rather than us saying loop five times, right? So uh, in this particular case, the while loop checks the condition of whether or not the variable q is less than the register bx. Uh, if it is, then we're going to run the inside of this loop. If it isn't, uh, we're going to skip past it. When we run the inside of the loop, however, what makes this a little different from an if with only a true, uh, because that's basically all these things are, is when we get to the bottom of the while loop, we're going to jump back up to the top unconditionally to make sure that we can check this uh, sentinel condition again. 
uh, and if it ever fails, uh, then we skip past the meat of the loop. So it's a fairly simplistic structure. Let's check it out. We've got a label at the top to mark the beginning of our while loop again, because we'll need to loop back up. That's sort of the nature of looping. Uh, and because it's pre-sentinel, we immediately compare uh, our uh, do a comparison to make our condition. So we compare the contents of Q to the BX register. Uh, and if Q is greater than or equal to BX, the inverted logic of what we wrote in the C, then that means the C logic, uh, ha the C logical condition has failed. So we're going to jump past the meat of the loop to the end of the while so that we can continue on with our computations. If, however, it is not greater than or equal, it must be less than, and that was what made the C condition true. So in that case, we don't jump and we fall through to the true part of our if statement, which is really the meat of the loop. We increment Q and subtract 5 from BX. And then when we're done with that, we jump unconditionally back up to the top of the loop so we can check our condition again uh, and potentially skip out of the loop. Now let's look at for loops. There are really two varieties of for loops that I care to discuss uh, in this video. The first one is uh, what we'll just call an average for loop, which is really uh, a counted while loop, so a pre-sentinel loop. For loops and while loops are basically the exact same thing, at least in this form. And uh, the for loop is no more than a shorthand for a while loop. You can understand this if you kind of look at these three conditions uh, that are laid out next to each other on the same line of code. This is a hard thing for a new programmer uh, to understand sometimes because the position of the code is confusing to the actual runtime placement of the code. For example, uh, it looks like all three of these uh, are a part of this for loop. It, really, they're just part of the structure of a loop they don't all happen inside the loop. In fact, getting i set to zero, that only happens once before the loop really executes, right? So it's an initialization of the sentinel variable. Uh, the check on whether i is less than or equal to count, or less than count, well, that does happen right here at the top of the loop at each iteration. Incrementing i also happens each iteration, but not at the top of the loop. It happens at the very end of the loop right before we jump back up to the top. So uh, if you think about it a little, you can understand why beginning programmers have uh, some trouble when they first pick up the concept of a for loop. In actuality, it's exactly the same as this while loop that I've got written here. We initialize i to zero, then we can start a traditional while loop where the, uh, the pre-sentinel condition is to verify that i is less than count. And if it is not, then we're going to jump past the meat of the loop, just like an if with only a true, uh, with only a true portion. Uh, we'll jump past on the opposite condition when it fails so that we can continue on with life. Otherwise, the condition must hold, and so we fall into the loop, execute its stuff, increment the sentinel variable i at the bottom, and then jump back to the top. That's exactly what this code uh, in assembly does. So we move a 0 into i to initialize our sentinel variable. We've got a label for the top of our while loop because we always need to jump back up in order to do a loop. And because it's pre-sentinel, we check the sentinel variable right at the top. So we compare i to count. And if it is not less than uh, count, meaning if it is greater than or equal to count, that means the C-level condition fails, so we should jump, in this case, past the end of the loop. And if we don't, then it must mean that the C condition holds, uh, and so we fall down into the meat of the loop where we do stuff. And afterwards, we'll increment the I sentinel variable, uh, and then jump unconditionally back to the top of the loop where we can uh, check the condition again to see if we need to continue. Now there's one last uh, loop I'd like to look at, and that's the second version of a for loop. Uh, and if you compare what I've written here at the top in C or C++ to that that's on the previous slide, you'll notice they're identical. And that's because uh, these two loops could, peer, could appear in your high-level code in the same fashion. But what I want to say distinguishes this version 
is that whoever wrote the stuff that's in here, uh, it's stuff that isn't uh, reliant in the on the order that I progresses to manage the counting of the loop. So for the fixed count loop, we may have a variable like count that gets its value from some unknown data, but whatever it is, uh, like the length of an array or something like that, it's just there to make sure that we we do this loop a very specific number of times. But the actual variable i's order, whether it goes up or say down, doesn't matter. In those logical conditions, we could have written the for loop in a high level language like this, or we could just as easily have started i at count and then decremented i as it moves towards zero and continue to do that as long as i is greater than zero. Right? So if this is possible, where for our for loop we could have written it either as an incrementing loop or a decrementing loop, then we have the opportunity at the assembly level to do something called a do loop, which is not the same as a do while loop at a high level. This is different. It's a loop that uses two unique instructions. Uh, one is the do instruction, which just sets the CX register to a particular value. And the other is a loop instruction. And the loop instruction kind of does multiple things uh, in one go. So let's take a quick peek at this. Uh, to prime my loop, I use the do instruction, do count. That moves the number count into the CX register. Then I have the actual uh, top proper of my loop and I've labeled it do loop rather than do while because I distinguish these two very specifically in my code. Then I do the stuff that is the meat of this loop and when I get to the bottom instead of seeing me do any increments or comparisons or that kind of stuff you just see this single instruction loop back up to do loop. Now, uh, that generally means that when we get here, we're going to loop back up there and repeat this loop. But the loop instruction is more subtle than that. What it actually does is it first decrements the CX, re CX register, so it subtracts 1 from CX. Then it checks to see if CX has gotten down to 0 or below yet. Uh, if it has, then this instruction will not jump back up here to the label that's provided. Instead, uh, it will just fall through and continue on. So as long as uh, when we execute the loop instruction, after it decrements C, if CX, or decrements CX, if CX is still greater than zero, then we're going to loop back up to the top and continue looping. So imagine if count had a three in it when we start. So we say, do this thing three times. Uh, so it goes in, does the loop the first time, then three gets decremented to two, uh, and it jumps back up. Now we go through uh, the second time, and the 2 gets decremented to 1 at the end. And since it's still greater than 0, we jump back up. Now we do it a third time, and we decrement 1 in CX down to 0. And so the loop instruction no longer jumps up because CX doesn't contain a value greater than 0 after the internal decremental loop instruction. So we fall through. So then with these two lines, of control flow code. Uh, I'm able to pull off uh, the same as uh, a do while loop that we had before that had many more lines and actually used up more cycles per iteration of the loop. So if we can do a do loop in this form where it was otherwise a for loop that could have gone with an increment or a decrement, we're actually going to boost the performance of our program and shrink the number of lines of code. So be on the lookout uh, for your opportunities to use this particular loop in your AT Robot assembly program.